want to thank you for joining us today as we take a look at the book of Ephesians tonight, changing our venue in the Bible. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the blessings of this day, and may your continued strength be upon us as we open up your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're taking a look at the book of Ephesians. How awesome is that? We had been looking at 2 Corinthians, and remember, the Corinthian church was a mess of a church. They were an absolute disaster. They were ready to kill each other. They had so many problems. They didn't even understand the appropriate theology. This is not true with the, the Ephesians. The church at Ephesus is a much more peaceful church. They're peaceful with one another. They're operating more like a church ought to be. So there's no real harsh lessons here. All this seems to be is a book that Paul has written around 60 AD uh, to the book in Ephesus just to continue to encourage them to grow in their relationship with God. And so it's really an exciting book. It's one of those books that was served as an inspiration to the early church. In fact, it got copied so many times. I think, I'm not positive about this, but I'm pretty sure that it is probably, of all the New Testament books that we have, the most copied book in the entire New Testament. What do I mean by that? The Greek text was copied and copied and copied and copied and copied and disseminated and I think we have over 850 copies of the Greek text of the book of Ephesians. It shows you how important a book this was to the early church, that they just wanted to make sure it was spread all over Christendom at that time. And so uh, you're going to find out in the next few weeks what an exciting book the book of Ephesians is. But don't expect there to be a shoe to drop. Paul isn't scolding them in any way. He's just trying to make sure that they're on the same page theologically. And so let's take a look at the very opening chapter of the book of Ephesians. First of all, part, Paul starts with a greeting, and that's what we're missing, verses uh, 1 to 2, just a, a basic greeting. He's greeting the faithful saints in Ephesus. And then Paul goes on, verse 3. So blessed be, by the way, this is all one sentence. You get an F if you're to write this in, in English, a sentence this long. Okay, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So we have been richly blessed. He's just trying to remind us of that. So let's, let's put that down there. Paul tends to tie all these thoughts together, and he has thought after thought after thought. Each one develops the next, the next, the next. He, Paul uses a lot of participles. Uh, when he writes, and you have to try to figure out what the participle develops. And so he'll, he'll start with a phrase, and then he'll have a participle that will develop that phrase, and a participle that will develop that participial phrase, and then a participle will develop that participial phrase. And it gets really complex to try to understand Paul. This is why he writes in these huge sentences, and these thoughts are all connected. So we start with the very th first thing is that you have been, let's put a different color, You've been blessed. Not just a little bit, but richly blessed. Because you've been blessed by the riches from heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Okay. Just as he chose Christ, so notice now he's focusing on Jesus. Okay. So you've been blessed. You've been blessed by who? By Jesus. Now he's going to develop Jesus. You see how Paul does this? So you got to realize this when you get into Paul. So just as he chose Jesus, Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. So Jesus is not, he wants to make sure that they understand Jesus isn't just another guy who was born and kind of was a good guy, kind of like... Um, um, kind of like the Latter-day Saints. He was just local boy made good, okay? No, Jesus isn't just a local boy made good. Jesus was existed before the foundation of the world. He pre-existed. He is transcendent, okay? Now, we see this in other passages of Scripture, too, in John chapter 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John wants to make sure that we understand that. Paul is trying to do with that in his way. So he, he needs to understand that we know, need to know that Jesus pre-existed. So we've been blessed from heaven. 
Oh, this Jesus guy, he, he, he's from heaven. He pre-existed. All right. So, and he was chosen. He was destined, or he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. Now he turns to us. So Jesus is the pre-existing one. And now this brings us into this because just as Jesus was predestined to be the one to bring, to bring us into adoption, okay? So now he's turning to us. You see how, how complex his arguments are. We're blessed. Jesus preexisted. He's the one that brings that blessing, makes, brings us adoption as children. He's destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ according to the gospel, the good pleasure of his will. Why are we adopted as children of God? Well, just because. That's it. Just because. No reason. God loves us. That's it. So if you think that you're chosen to be adopted as a child of God because you're somehow special, because you've gone to church, because you're a good person, you've got to rethink this. You've just been chosen because, just because. You know, it's kind of like that. They just, you just love each other. God loves you. Kind of like our kids, because, gosh, that's who we are. He's using, again, this family language. So he destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. No other reason. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So we're adopted because of, and, and we had grace bestowed upon us. Again, this kind of goes back to this idea that we're blessed. He, this is the overarching idea. Everything right now is developing this idea of, we're blessed. And this is the reason why. He wants to make sure he defines what that blessing is. There is no, it's not, by the way, it's not materialistic blessing. This is one of the problems in the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America is that we get fixated on materialistic blessings. Okay, you got the name and claim it crowd that believes it's all about materialistic blessings. God is going to bless you. If you want a million dollars and you have enough faith, God is going to give you a million dollars. By the way, that's not me. I'm being sarcastic. I hope you understand that. I don't believe that. It's crap. Only in the fat, filthy, wealthy country of the United States of America could this type of materialistic message come out of the Bible. Because... Paul is doing everything to make sure people understand it has nothing to do with materialistic blessing. It's all about the grace of God gifted to us. Heavenly blessings, okay? Heavenly blessings. Something more. So he goes on. In him, verse 7, we have redemption through his blood. Okay, so now he's kind of asking, okay, so we know the blessing. We know that it's gifted to us in Jesus Christ. Now he's kind of addressing how does this happen? How do we get this blessing? How? How? What's the mechanism of it? How did this come into our lives? You know, if you get rich one day and people say, well, how do you get so rich? Well, I had a rich uncle. He died. Okay, he left me all this money. Ah, yes. Isn't it great? Okay, by the way, not true. Actually, kind of true. I had a, a, a very wealthy uncle who was very kind to me. He gave me a... Uh, a nice little little chunk that ended up paying a lot of our hospital bills at a time where we were in deep trouble. So God must have known that. And I'm very grateful for that uncle's generosity that helped us out of a very deep hole that we were in. But this is, so the mechanism of getting that wealth was, my uncle died, he left his money in the will. Well, okay, how did we get so blessed? How did we get the riches from heaven? Did somebody have to die? Huh. Yes, actually. <laughs> All right. Yes, in him we have redemption through what? How? His blood. So how do we get so blessed? Because of Jesus' blood. Okay? In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses 
according to the riches of his grace. So again, we've received forgiveness. Again, not because we earned it. He is really hammering this idea in multiple different ways. Not because we earned forgiveness. It's all again about Jesus. It's about what Jesus has done for us. Okay? He goes on. He continues to develop this idea. He's getting to be a mess. Well, this is kind of Paul's sentences here. This is what he does. Thanks, Paul. All right. Where were we? Oh, he lavished upon us uh, with all wisdom and insight. He's made known the mystery to us, the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. Okay, so now the how becomes, how do we know this? We know it. We now know this. Okay, so we've been blessed. How do we be blessed? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We now know this. We've been, it's been revealed to us. So we understand this. Okay. Um, let me see. Verse 9. He's made this known the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. We know this, that the ultimate reason for this is to bless all. You know this secret. You know this. So he's assuming that we know this, but there's a reason for this. So there, the reason, actually this would be better here. So we have one, we've been blessed. Two, how have we been blessed? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Three, there's a reason for that blessing. Because we know so that God can bless everyone. Now, when I say bless everyone in all things, it's not just people, it's the universe. You do realize that humans were created to care for this planet and the creatures of this planet, right? You do read, it's not just all about humans. Humans had a purpose within God's creation to tend to God's garden so that all the creatures of the planet might flourish. God has this bigger plan. Now, there's a, what oftentimes is seen as a pejorative word, universalism. Um, the reason why it's a nasty word is because Christians don't like everybody being saved. We want to make sure that's our exclusive domain and that we've done, and it's works righteousness again, that somehow we've done something to get ourselves into heaven and that we're better than everybody else and all these other slum, uh, uh, slimy people are, 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 are not going to have a place there. Oh, that makes us feel so good for some reason. No, the whole purpose is that God wants to bless everything. This is the secret. We know it. God wants to bless everything. So stop thinking about it as though it's your little domain and you've got this little secret just for yourself and oh well <laughs> everybody else is going to go to hell no come on man we know this and we know that God wants to bless everyone God has a universal love for everybody yes it's that Muslim down the street yes it's that Jew down the street Yes, it's that atheist. Yes, it's that gay person. That transgender woman. We got to let go of our bigotries, man. God has a universal plan to bring us all together somehow through Jesus Christ. That's his plan. Who are you you going to argue with God? All right. God wants to gather up all things, verse 10, all things, not just the Christians, not just the Jews, all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11, in Christ we also have obtained an inheritance. We have obtained an inheritance. So, uh, don't worry. We are receivers of this. 
You've been included in this plan. So that's this next part, verse 12, or verse 11. And him you've also obtained an inheritance. Having been destined according to the purpose. Remember, who else was destined? <laughs> this, this word ties us back in here. Jesus was destined. You too are destined. Okay, you have a role here. You too have been destined. Very clever how Paul does this. But man, it gets ugly when you see it written down here. So, we've received blessing because of Jesus. Jesus was destined for this. We know this because God wants to bless the world, but we're destined to be a part of this process. Okay. Oh, Paul. Okay, Christ, we've also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose. We've obtained an inheritance. I want to, I want to, I know we're running out of room here. I wish I had a bigger board. I need a bigger board. We've received an inheritance. Who receives an inheritance? You know, I did mention my uncle dying and leaving an inheritance intentionally. Okay, God leaves us an inheritance. Oh, wait, do you hear the inheritance that God has left us? Wait. Oh, just wait. You're going to be blown away. Because it isn't a few thousand dollars. This is money. We've received inheritance, having been destined according to his purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel. We've been, we receive inheritance again, that refers back to him because of what he's done again, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for praise, his praise and glory. Okay, so we have received inheritance, so we have the security to know that we can be a part of this process of blessing this world. In him also, you, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, it's the word sozo, salvation, it actually literally means healing or wholeness. You've been made whole. So what inheritance you receive? You've received wholeness, completeness. Wholeness and completeness in your relationship with God. Wholeness and completeness in your relationship with yourself. You should be at peace with yourself. Wholeness, completeness in your relationship with those around you. This is what salvation means. Okay? In him also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, you were marked with a seal of the promised Holy Spirit. I don't even know how to fit this in here. Okay? Except I told you, you've been saved. That's what it is. You've been made well. You've been made whole. And you've been marked with the Holy Spirit so that you know that you fit into the plan of God's blessing of the entire world. You've received the seal of the Holy Spirit. When we do a baptism in our church and we baptize you know, one of the things we'll do afterwards is basically say these very words. You've been marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit. What does the seal of the Holy Spirit do? It's a mark that says, this is mine. Keep your hands off, Satan. <laughs> Satan can't touch you. You are now officially God's. Okay? So you've received the seal of the Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to his praise and glory. So what do we receive? What's the inheritance we receive? To be God's people. That means the kingdom of heaven is ours because of Jesus Christ. So he's setting up this argument to make sure that the Ephesians know who they are. To make sure you know who you are. You've been blessed. You've been blessed because of what Christ has done. And we know that we've been chosen because God wants to bless the entire world. And God has made us a part of the family of God. We have proof of that in the seal of the Holy Spirit. I hope that makes you feel good. But I want to make sure you're clear with this. You're not a good person because you're not in heaven because of something you've done. You've been richly blessed because, gosh, 
That's just the nature of God, to bless and love you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for the claim that you have made upon our lives, that you've called us children. We are inheritors of the kingdom of heaven, inheritors of salvation. We've been made whole, complete, in a relationship with you and with one another. And your intention, you've got a very aggressive and big agenda. You want to make sure the entire world comes under this domain. And we just give you thanks. You are relentless in your love for this world and will not stop until it happens. Use us, God. We're here for a purpose. Let us be participants in this beloved message of Jesus Christ. For he asks this in your precious name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.